if you tell the history of slavery right, you got a big problem on your hands. The slave trader didn't take some savage out of Africa. He took a human being. He sold him like an animal and separated him from his family. America invented the cruelest slavery in the history of the world because it broke up black families. After slavery was over, America kept breaking up the black man's family. And that's some awful history to teach. Now, if you want to look history right straight in the eye, you're going to get a black eye. Because it isn't important whether a few black heroes got lost or stolen or strayed in America's history textbooks. What's important is why they got left out. Now, this country has got a psychological history. There was a master race, and there was a slave race. And though there isn't any political slavery anymore, those same old attitudes have hung around. I mean, the burning part of burn, baby, burn, is right here in this classroom. Let me illustrate it for you. Let's take these drawings. No matter what a child draws, he's really picturing himself. Ask a secure child to draw a tree, and he's likely to draw a bountiful spreading tree. A black child drew this tree, cut off in its growth, stark, bare, ungratified. It works the same way with drawings of people, normal children, average drawings. The mood is happy, the child feels capable, the drawings are complete, and the arms are developed to emphasize strength. These children were old enough to draw complete figures. The significant fact is what they left out. Arms, hands. A child may sense that a situation in life is so powerless that he himself is equivalent to an armless man. My own study reveals that armless people appear three times more frequently in the drawings by black children than those by white. The faceless being suggests that these youngsters not only feel themselves to be less than they might be, they don't even feel themselves to be. The black child who is forced to live in a hostile world may disappear in self-defense. He drifts through life feeling like a shadow. He stops caring and he stops trying. A child who has this on his mind cannot be a child. A child who has this on his mind could want to burn down cities when he gets older. Six days of rioting in a Negro section of Los Angeles left behind scenes reminiscent of war-torn cities. More than a hundred square blocks were decimated by fire and looters, and few buildings were left intact. Firemen were harassed by snipers and brick-throwing hoodlums as they attempted to control the fires, many of which were left to burn themselves out. As the National Guard moved in to restore comparative calm, the losses by fire alone were put at $200 million. No attempt has yet been made to estimate the losses suffered at the hands of the looters who stole everything from liquor to playpen. Who stole everything from liquor to playpens. Birth of a Nation pretended to tell the story of the Civil War and what happened afterwards when the slaves were freed. White woman couldn't walk on her own sidewalk if you believe the picture. In the South, Negroes got the right to vote, and the movie showed black vote collectors refusing to accept white votes, and black people sneaking in extra votes. And if these black bad guys don't look very bad to you, it's probably because they were white actors wearing burnt cork. Negro legislators took over in the South, and in the film they were made to look like apes. And this was the movie version of how it looked in the Southern State Legislature. They drank whiskey, they ate chicken with their hands in the state house, and they put their feet up on the table with the shoes off. And of course, they passed all sorts of crazy laws according to the film, like anybody could marry anybody they wanted to. It was obvious to anyone who saw this picture that Negroes weren't fit to govern themselves or anyone else because they really weren't people. Colonel Cameron, a former officer in the Confederate Army, is all upset over the way Northerners and the freed slaves are changing his South. 
taking the mint julep right out of his mouth. So he takes a walk one day while he's worrying about it, and he sees two white kids playing, and then four black kids come along. Being hardly human and naturally afraid of ghosts, the black kids run. Colonel Cameron sees the whole scene, gets his great idea. And with this, that great white all-American organization, the KKK, was born. The cavalry and the bedsheet has come to the rescue. The South is saved. In this picture, the Ku Klux Klan was the good boy who saved the South. Bert Williams was one of the great vaudeville performers. He couldn't get parts in white pictures, so he made a lot of short comedies. He played the part most Americans consider typical Negro. It wasn't bad, really, just lazy, stupid, and happy the way he was. And his feet hurt. Oh, yeah. And my foot. Oh, my God. They shot me in my bunion, man. Man, I can't go on. He was afraid of most everything, and when he was scared, he shook and his teeth chattered. Unlike a scared white man, the black man's eyes could pop out of his head. And when he was scared, he was so scared he couldn't talk. And he was also so scared he couldn't run. Black women, on the other hand, were steady and imperturbable. They stood like a rock on the face of things that scared black men. Another strange physical characteristic was when they were really very scared. The guys turned white. They had a lot of other great qualities besides being cowardly. For instance, they stole chickens. Who's in there? Who's in there? Ain't nobody in there but us chickens. They shot craps. That's your papa talking to you now, Dice. Come on. Just just hit him one more time. Ah. I was gonna take me away. Gonna catch me a rabbit. Well, shut my mouth, rabbit tracks. Oh, no, no, no. 
of either. They were afraid of gorillas. Wallace Rose, is that you next to me? Wallace Rose, is that you next to me? Now come on, Wallace Rose, now don't turn around. Come on, tell me the truth. Is that you next to me? Wallace Rose, do you say yes, that's you? <laughs> they were also afraid of ghosts and skeletons. Yeah. Is that you scratching my head? Jim? Jim! Now come on, now what are you looking at? <laughs> What's your hurry, Buzz? Even when they were little boys, they had these characteristics. Farina and our gang was the boy, boy. Come out, come out, wherever you is, wherever you be, wherever you do. Come out, come out, wherever you am. How's the government looking for you? Hang well, on, stranger. You, you scare somebody stiff like that. I'm looking for hillbillies as you was. I ain't saying I am, I ain't saying I ain't. Well, that's close enough for me, because I'm tired of walking myself. The government told me I got... Bring in a hillbilly, so you come go with me to Washington. I ain't a gone. That's the color of another hall. Mm. Well, I tell you, you don't go for me. We go for the Navy. No! I don't go for the Navy. It's, well, I tell you, go for the Army. No, I won't go for the Army. It's too bad he was as good at it as he was. The character he played was planted in a lot of people's head, and they remember it the rest of their lives as clear as an auto accident. What's that? Are you an Indian? Yes, I'm Indian. Man, you don't know. I got, I'm Indian. I got one full of Cherokee, two full of Seminole, and... I got four fills Hiawatha. Wait a minute. Hiawatha was a woman. I can't help it. I got four fifths of them. He played in movies with other actors who were as American as Mom's Raspberry Jello. If they accepted the stereotype, how wrong could it be? Judge Regan, can I see you some, please? Well, I'm pretty busy. Yes, yeah, sir, but I just want to ask if you cared about it. Care about what? About over at my house. Nightful last year. Oh, another baby? Yes, yeah, so you sure guessed it, you heard. What's his name? Oh, we call him L.R. Lars Rigby Livingston. Oh, named him after me, did you? Yes, yeah, so Lars Rigby. I told my wife, Ethel, I said, Honey, I know Judge Shell going to be gratified. Well, of course, yes, I appreciate the honor. Yes, yeah, sir. I suppose a compliment, and I ought to do something for you. Yes, yeah, so that's what I thought. Cause you come over to my place, Ma, and I'll give you a job. Yeah. Rake and leave. All American little Shirley Temple played a lot of parts that involved her with black actors. She was always real nice to them. Oh, James Henry, you always do it wrong. This is an imitation step and fetch it named Willie Best with Shirley. Come on, Miss Virgie. I just won't budge. I'll show them I'm not. The cute little white girl was brave and strong in the face of danger. And the big black man was stupid and cowardly. What are you afraid of them for? Oh, honey child, them Yankees is mighty powerful. They can even change the weather. Yes? Whenever they come around, I never know whether it's one or summer. I'm shivering and sweating at the same time. James Henry. Serve these cookies to Master Harold and wipe his chin. Yes, ma'am, Miss 
She was good to them and they were good to her. Sort of a master and pet relationship. How would you like to see Uncle Billy dance? Oh. Oh. All right, James, Taylor, let's get going, son. This is Bill Bojangles Robinson, one of the great ones. But if he wanted to work and dance, he had to come into a picture through the servant's entrance. Shirley was good to children, too. They loved their little mistress, and she treated them real good. Hello, Sally Ann. Just like they were equals. Go on now, Sally Ann. Miss Virgie? Please, ma'am. We all done come here to wish him any happy, happy returns. That's it. Many happy returns of the day. And we all done made you a darling. Here it is. Miss Percy, there was more I had to say, but... Let me, I forgot it. <laughs> you said everything, Sally Ann. Don't you worry. This is the very nicest present I got. Thank you ever so much. Yes, indeed, children. It was very thoughtful and sweet. Come down here. I'll see you later, and I'll save you some cake. Oh! oh. They did things like eat watermelon in watermelon eating contests. Then another favorite for the newsreel cameraman was to film people throwing things at them. Good sport. Some college football publicity man decided this was a good idea. And there were a lot of very funny golf pictures. If you weren't black, they were funny, I guess. Just bite out of your mouth. Don't miss, boss, don't miss. <laughs> well, you keep still, see? Otherwise, you'll have flour in your room and you won't smell them. Oh, boy. Oh, wait, hey! Everything suggested the black man was nothing. Take to him your race for a wedding gift. The prestige of the white man. That means everything you stand for. And it is the only weapon you two will have. Prestige. But it is enough to preserve you. Yes, sir. And I'll try to remember it. If you'll kiss me. Even though most non-white natives of any place were savages in films, it often pleased white producers to endow a few chosen blacks with the virtue of great loyalty to him, the white man. Here's one defending Ann Harding to the death. There was always one loyal and true black man who would do anything for his master. Some of them were wonderful people. You know if you really get a good one. Well, this is your destination, folks. They made very good chauffeurs. Look good in their caps. And they were great at serving all kinds of drinks. Mmm, that coffee of yours stays with you like poor relation. What says you got there? Your sassarous tea. Wherever there was a thirsty master, there were they also. Mom, Beth. Aunt Jemima. Will you have enough? I don't know if I can stretch one small chicken. But as long as the water's running, we'll have soup enough. Lobby. 
Will you take Kay upstairs and wash all that goo off her face and give her a good... The one question they never answered when the Negro woman was taking care of the white woman's kids, who was taking care of hers? They did all kinds of odd jobs around the picture, like walking horses. When they weren't walking the horses, they were out back playing craps, of course. Recreation. They met people at the station for their masters. Is, uh, is, uh, you folks, uh... We've come all the way from Ireland. Mr. Milford's expecting us. Mr. Milford. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you is which I'm looking for. I'm Mr. Milford's boy. His boy, you say? Yes, sir. Murphy is the name, sir. Did you say Murphy? Yes, Miss Murphy. They calls me Walking Murphy. Walking Murphy? Yes, sir. Most of us Murphys down here just sit. I walk. They make wonderful servants, all kinds in pictures. Dumb but loyal. Isn't it a beautiful night? I just love parties, don't you? I beg your pardon? Thank you kindly. Yes, hello. Oh, this is Barry Dunn's residence. Oh, come on, Mona, and you ready, ready, come on, Mona. Things were getting pretty tough during the 30s. And a good thing for a lot of black actors was that they made a movie called The Green Pastures with, like they say, a cast of thousands. It gave a lot of people work, but it had all the old stereotyped characters. It was clever and funny and all black, but it was a white man's picture. I'm the Indian. Henry, you sure got the prettiest wings. Oh, they just my old ones. Cigars, gentlemen, cigars. Just have yourself. Cigars, gentlemen, cigars. Oh, Lord, the smoke house is empty. Oh, Lord, let me get them groceries. Oh, Lord, let me see that little six. Where? Come on, you're going to feed me or not? Hey! Why, well, you just a little boy, gambling and sinning, and doing tobacco like you was your own pappy. And you've been drinking sunny kick mammy wine. No, you're good, dear. I'm not good. Hey, Doc. And you've been drinking sunny kick mammy wine, too. You gamblers ought to be ashamed of yourself leading this boy to sin. Well, he's the best crap shoot in town. They had a black cast. The cast was different, but the stereotypes were the ones that the white people had come to know and love. They were shady characters with money. Well, I got the books right here, and they're open to each and every brother complete inspection. Get your hands off of that thing there. <laughs> So you want to see the financial books, huh? Yeah. Well, there he is. There he is. You done see them. Had the meeting adjourned. Neither they were still them. slow and lazy. Are you sure they are not here? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, they told me so themselves. <laughs> Have them report to our office right away. I sure tell them, all right. I got to see <laughs> They had trouble with the English language. Misused words a lot. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And Mr. Brown, my new secretary here, ain't gonna have no time for no extra cuticle activities. And I'm telling you now, as long as you have that secretary in your office, I'm going to work as a secretary myself. Oh, give me an old tomato, huh? <laughs> I'm putting my foot down. They had trouble with women. <laughs> and it was always the women who were dominant. Stanley Kramer has let us use some scenes from Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. You look at these and remember Birth of a Nation. This is the opening scene when Katherine Houghton is bringing Sydney home for the first time. This is Dr. Prentice, John, Miss Matilda Binks. Pleased to meet you, Miss Binks. I've certainly heard a great deal about you. Katherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy are the girl's parents. God, he's right. She's 23 years old, and the way she is is just exactly the way we brought her up to be. We answered her question. She listened to our answers. We told her it was wrong to believe that the white people were somehow essentially superior to the black people, or the brown or the red or the yellow ones, for that matter. People who thought that way were wrong to think that way. Sometimes hateful, usually stupid, but always, always wrong. 
That's what we said. And when we said it, we did not add, but don't ever fall in love with a colored man. Well, Sidney tells it like it is to his old man. You and your whole lousy generation believes the way it was for you is the way it's got to be. And not until your whole generation has lain down and died will the dead weight of you be off our backs. You understand? You've got to get off my back. as a colored man I think of myself as a man By the time the world of movies and the world of education get into the streets of black America, some strange things happen. Because what history and the movies have told the black man is that he's nobody unless he joins the white world. The white world only comes into the black ghetto by messenger. The message used to read, black is nothing, white is beautiful. For this reason, a lot of black people have spent their lives trying to be white. For instance, hair. Some people still call straight hair good hair because it looks like white hair. Kinky hair is bad hair. The man on the right is having his hair cut naturally. The man on the left is having a process. What the barber is doing is applying harsh chemicals to his head so he'll have straight hair like all those movie stars have. It's a painful long job that costs about six dollars and has to be looked after every couple of weeks. These days, many young black men find the whole process demeaning. It's going out of fashion, even in the ghetto. It takes pain to become like a white man, and more pain when you know you can't make it. For a while, it seemed to the black community that the way to escape was to get as rich as possible and look as white as possible. And as affluence came to some black people, all the lessons of history and all the lessons of the movie seemed to be succeed on the white man's terms. So, the middle class Negro took the white man's dreams and tried to make them his. Today, many middle class Negroes have the education and the money to provide themselves with all the white man's dreams but one, universal social acceptability. He has not yet been able to join in any normal or casual way the white man's affluent society. So he has his own. The white man's attitudes still exclude the black man and the black woman. There's a fallacy in this country that says that any man by his merits can make it. That is not true. Do not believe that. It is not true. Because any man in this society cannot make it. That's where the whole fallacy is. The white man keeps saying to you, if you just stop being black, if you just stop shooting your, your, your people on Saturday night, if you just stop talking Negro dialect, if you clean yourself up, get yourself a job, you're going to make it in this society. It's not true. I know for myself I have a master's degree in social work, and I know that people won't accept me. And I was an honor student, and I know I can make it. They won't accept me. They don't discriminate against me because I'm a Christian. They don't discriminate against me because I'm a Christian. They're discriminating against me because I'm black. The message down here is coming in stronger. It's be yourself, be black. 
The new generation of black young Americans is asserting itself in a new and possibly disturbing way. But not all black people were receptive to Garvey's message. The established leaders of the black communities, preachers, ward politicians, and the small, aggressive middle class of blacks rejected his ideas. They despised his followers and ridiculed Garvey. He was openly attacked by the oldest organization of black Americans, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Its president, W.E.B. Du Bois, scoffed. When Mr. Garvey brought his cohorts to Madison Square Garden, clad in fancy costumes and with new songs and ceremonies, and when ducking his dark head at the audience, he yelled, we are going to tell England, France, and Belgium to get out of Africa. America sat up, listened, laughed, and said, here at least is something new. Jeremiah 3 verse 12, go and proclaim these words to war the no horn. God says, read that again. How happened it? God says, how happened what? Go and proclaim these words toward the north. Where are we located at? North America. Yes. God it God. make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be. A sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment. And it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. If you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. And I'll place it in the hands of a nation that doesn't even know my name. Be still and know that I'm God. Leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration. That's their business. But I'm afraid of that. That I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere to justice everywhere. <laughs> you, feel, you feel, however, that uh, that we're making progress in, in this country? No, and no, 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 no. Uh, I will never say that progress is being made. If you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six inches, there's no progress. Mm -hmm. You pull it all the way out, that's not progress. The progress is healing the wound that's the blow, that's the blow made. And they haven't even begun to pull a knife out, much less try and pull, uh, heal the wound. You have, uh, you have they no won't even admit the knife is there. It's trouble that you have gotten yourself in. If you notice, whenever I refer to America, I don't say we. I don't say I or our. I say you. This is yours. It's not me or mine. And you'll find that this thinking is increasing among black people today. They don't say our government, our president, our senate, our congress, nor do they say our troubles. They say your president, your congress, your senate, and your troubles. What was it about him that struck you? Well, for one thing, the discipline, the, uh, the fact that uh, everyone was organized and uh, the respect for each other and the way Malcolm addressed me, uh, sir, uh, yes sir, no sir, he, the immaculate uh, cleanliness, the restaurant and uh, the whole demeanor of Malcolm as an individual. And then when Malcolm began to explain to me about his name, about why he called himself X, and the fact that he refused to carry the slave master's name, and uh, he went into a, a lecture on the word Negro, explaining to me that uh, most English words derive its meaning from Latin or Greek. And in Greek, the G in Negro became C, which meant that N-E-C-R-O means dead, or necropolis, necro, necrophilia, necrosis. All of these terms relate to something dead, something without life. And then Malcolm looked at me and said, well, you know, don't, we, don't they call you a spook? You know, you Negroes are spooks. 
a walking dead man. So, you know, that day on the way home, I started thinking about this man and some of the things he talked about. And uh, I wanted to know more about Malcolm. I wanted to know more about the movement. And uh, that developed the fascination. Mm -hmm. Now, was, what was the extent of your relationship? Was it just that you were his photographer, or was it more involved than that? In the beginning, it was a photographic thing from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. and then I quit my job to work for Malcolm as his personal photographer. And the reason why, uh, at that time, Malcolm had an uncanny sense of the value of the media and the value of pictures. He knew that the media was creating him and of the value of the media and the value of pictures. He knew that the media was creating him in terms of being a monster. All of those early photographs of Malcolm depicted him as some kind of monster, fist clenched and blazing eyes and teeth clenched, all this sort of thing. So he wanted me to make photographs of him as a human being. And it was during this process that we became friends and uh, my relationship changed. I no longer was an impartial journalist as a photographer. I began to take pictures and also to think in terms of what kind of contribution I could make to him. How make I to could, him? Yes, how I could help him in his... could help him in his movement because I would go out sometimes and uh, meet with other members of, of various newspapers to find out how they felt about Malcolm, how they felt about Malcolm's movement. And uh, I would sit down with him uh, at a later date and explain to him how he was being depicted, how the public was seeing him. And in that way, I was able to help Malcolm. I would help Malcolm to understand how his image was coming over. Why would you? Why were you so concerned and obsessed with helping him? Well, <coughs> I feel, as I do now, that uh, Malcolm is the only leader we had, as far as I'm concerned. I uh, I listened to all of the other leaders at that time, and uh, they all were involved with some segment of being an integrationist. Uh, they all wanted to lead our people into a movement where they would become invisible. But Malcolm wasn't doing that. Malcolm was the only leader out there that taught black people to be proud of being black and not try to be something that you can never be. And to go a step further, uh, Malcolm thought that integration was ridiculous because yes, uh, because a no minority group can bring about integration with a majority giving group. giving them political knowledge about the true situation and organizing them and teaching ourselves that we must arm ourselves. We have to put a shotgun in every door, yeah. from door to door, from block to block, from community to community, from city to city. From state to state, across this racist nation, so we can have the power in our hands. So we can have the power in our hands. Teams of the mass media who manipulate uh, information, uh, uh, they distort uh, statistics, they distort uh, reports, uh, essentially they distort reality. But we define the pigs as those who are actively involved in the machinery of oppression. Three categories of evil avaricious businessmen, demagogic politicians, and the racist pig cops. These are the pigs of the power structure. Mm -hmm. And Julian Bond wouldn't fall in that particular category. Uh, he would fall in the category of all the other black Democrats who are involved in that. Uh, the lackeys from the colony helping the uh, oppressors from the mother country carry out their oppression. You understand that? Yeah, yeah. All right. A number is a concept of quantity or an amount. That is wrong. No, no. A number is a concept of quantity or an amount. That is dead wrong. 
He's not only teaching new math to children whose ages range from 17 months to five years, he's decided to give them the emotional armor they need to protect themselves against the education they're sure to receive when they start kindergarten. Anybody tells you something wrong, are you gonna do it? No! Um, what do you want now? I want freedom. When do you want it? I want my freedom now. No, you have to wait till next week, Janelle. You can't have it now. How you, 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 can you wait till next week? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sit down. All right, young man, stand up. When do you want your freedom, young man? I want freedom now. You can wait till next week, though, can't you? No. Michael, you just have to wait till next week. You can't have it now. Are you willing to wait till next week? No. Suppose I said that um, you have to wait till next week. Now you're going to wait till next week, aren't you? No. How are you going to get your freedom? I will use any means necessary to get my freedom. Any means necessary? Yes. You know, you know all right, sit down. Young man, what is your name? My name is Eric Houston. Levante. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro America. What is freedom? Freedom is black power. What is black power? Black power is. Do you know what black power is? No. Well, then you should never use, you never should never make any statements if you don't know what they mean. I'm sorry, I don't know. All right. Um, how old are you, young man? I am four years old. You're not four, Eric. Now, you tell me your right age. How old are you? How old are you? I am four years old. Are you sure you're four? Yes. You're going to let me turn you around and tell you you're some other age? You're six years old, Eric. No. I can't hear you, Eric. No! Are you being frightened by me? No! I'm a teacher. I said you're six. I am four years old. All right, then. You stand up for it, then. You shouldn't be weak. You stand up and say it. You ought to scream it in my face if I try to tell you different, right? Yes. Have a seat. Stand up, young man. Are you a Negro, Travis? No. Are you a flunky, Travis? No. What are you? I am black and beautiful. And what else are you? Are you a boy? No. What are you? I'm a man. What kind of man? Black and beautiful man. Well, what kind? Are you an old man or a young man? Young man. Very good. Very good. Are you going to let somebody just make you a boy? No. All right. Suppose I tell you something wrong, Travis. Are you going to do it? Yes. You're going to do something if I tell you and it's wrong? No. Have a seat, young man. Eric, you're going to be reasonable, aren't you? No. Come here. Here you are, fine young man, right? Yes. Are you going to be scared of me? No. Are you going to be scared of some president of the United States? No! Some mayor? No! Some policeman? No! All right. You're a Negro. Yes! You're a Negro, Eric. No! Somebody passed me my stick. I said you're a Negro, boy. No! You're getting mighty soft. You're a Negro! No! Very good. All right, sit down. Uh, you, young man, you come here. Your nationality is American Negro. Yes. No. Your nation, now look, don't play with me. You're a Negro. No. I am your teacher. You are a Negro. No. Suppose I threatened to beat you, what would you say? Aren't you a Negro now? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Suppose I had some money in my pocket. Suppose I gave you a dollar to say that you're an American Negro. This is money now. Money talks. Money talks. This dollar, 
And if you don't say it, you don't get it. You're an American Negro, aren't you? No. You won't have any money. You know you need money, don't you? Yeah. You need money to live, don't you? Yes. All right. All you have to say, Leon, is that you're an American Negro. Aren't you an American Negro? Are you an American Negro? No. What are you? I'm black and beautiful. What's your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Very good, man. Keep it up. Go sit down. You had to think about that a minute, didn't you? Yeah. All right. All right, everybody. What is your nationality? My nationality is Afro-American. Good. All right. What I did is what people are going to do to you in different ways when you get out of the school. They're not going to just come right up to you and give you a dollar or say if you say that you're an Afro, if you say you're an American Negro, I'll give you a dollar. But they're going to be very nice to you, some of them, and they're going to try to, you know, get you not to love black people. They're going to try to get you to, you know, be something other than you are. They're going to try to make you, make it seem as though you're different from the masses of black people. And they want you to be, go away. And I'll tell you, I'll give you special things if you just come along with me and do what I say. But you must reject that. Now, you know what that means? That means you're not going to have the money you'd like to have. And money is not important. Come on, man. I need some money. I love you so much. I need some money. Hook a brother up. Give me some money. I need some cash. I'm going to get these Nikes. You know I can't have anything but the best. This hell figure sweater. Do you want me looking good for you? I need some money. Hook a sister up. I need some money. I need some cinnamon act for my baby. I need some Pampers for my baby. I need some Dolce Cabana for me. I need some Channel. I need, we need some money. We, you know, we have to buy things with it. But money is not the thing that we're living for. The only thing that makes a person worth living is being a man and being a woman. Being strong in character, being straight, telling the truth, and living in the truth, and doing the right thing. You understand that? So no matter what happens, I want you all to always tell the what. A couple months ago, referred to the situation that the West faces as Armageddon in a speech in Chicago before some distinguished Republicans, if there are such. <laughs> and, uh, he referred to this crisis that America is facing as Armageddon because of the nuclear-tipped missiles that are poised all over the earth. This destruction has ever turned loose on America. The Negro has no uh, fallout shelters. And white people who have them, you won't even let Negroes in white neighborhoods during peacetime. How will he get in your fallout shelter during wartime? You haven't yet desegregated New Rochelle. How are you going to let Negroes, when you're under attack, into a space that you yourself hardly have room in? Why, you're crazy if you think we even think that you will. So we're not relying on fallout shelter. We're not relying on air raid shelter. As I said earlier, we're relying on God. When, when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire the honorable, and brimstone, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that that's only a symbolic story designed to paint a prophetic picture of what America is faced with today. Because of the immorality and in indecency and corruption that exists, God has doomed America for destruction. The only salvation or escape is through God and with God. This is what we teach. And be, despite the fact that we tell you that we re rely 100% upon our God to protect us against the trouble that you have gotten yourself in. You didn't get us in this. It's trouble that you have gotten yourself in. If you notice, whenever I refer to... Yeah, the best way you can destroy a people, you take away their ability to reproduce themselves. Yeah. One of the few eyes. Yeah, and if he can make it out of here, so can I. Yeah, you gonna make it? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna make it. 
you're gonna make it out of here just like the rest of these niggas out here in a casket. First thing that's gonna take you out is these drugs we got for you. Uh -huh. We got the cocaine, heroin, crack cocaine. We got the uppers, the downers, the chiba, crystal, meth, acid. We got the nicotine for you. Huh? You don't want none of that? And don't forget about the alcohol, baby. Yeah, we got that more liquor, AKA liquid crack. Just for you. The big white lie. Its author says that for decades, the CIA has protected some of the world's biggest drug dealers, all supposedly in the interest of promoting democracy. Author Michael Levine was an undercover agent for the Drug Enforcement Agency for 25 years. You may also remember his 1990 best-selling book called The Drug War, The Deep Cover. Nice to have you back here. I, I mean, if this is true, the premise is so disturbing. I want to make sure that I understand it correctly, that our government, the U.S. government, particularly the CIA and the Pentagon, have supported and protected international drug barons in the name of fighting communism. Well, that's the pretext. Uh, let me put it very succinctly. Uh, what I'm saying is that while working undercover between the years of 1978 and, 19, and uh, 1982, posing as a mafia drug baron, half Hispanic, half Italian, I witnessed firsthand uh, the CIA commit high treason. I witnessed the sellout of the war on drugs. Uh, 1978, let me put it into historic uh, context. Uh, 1978, the demand for cocaine and later crack was skyrocketing. The need that during the 70s, you had the drug world, right? In the black cities, drugs was being poured into black communities at an alarming rate. And basically, it was to kill off the babies. It was to kill off the babies of these men who were brought over here as captives. Why? Because it was the rising of the messiahs, okay? Those black panthers were teaching their babies, and the, uh, the generation came out of Martin Luther King agenda, they were teaching their babies, and the Malcolm X uh, agenda, those people were teaching their babies, and these babies were going to grow with knowledge of themselves. So what did the society have to do, what did the white man have to do? He had to pollute the cities. So he made it a systematic thing, he brought out the D.A.R.E. program during the 80s, and he just wiped us out by putting guns and drugs into our community. And this is all part of the Bible, okay? This is all part of the Bible prophecies. Jeremiah 3 verse 12, go and proclaim these words to war the North. Hold on. God says, read that again. How happened it? God says, how happened what? Go and proclaim these words to the North. Where are we located at? North America. Yes. God knows where we at. Today, there's a new epidemic. Smokable cocaine, otherwise known as crack. It is an explosively destructive and often lethal substance which is crushing its users. Low goose, only way I begin the G York was drug loot. And let's start it like this, son. Rolling with this one and that one. Pulling out gats for fun. Put it But it was just a dream for the team who was a fiend. Started smoking wounds at 16. And running up in gates and doing hits by high stakes. Making my way on fire escapes. No question I was me for cracks and weed. The combination made my eyes bleed. No question, I would flow off and try to get the dough off. Sticking up right boys on board for it. My life got no better. Same damn low sweater. Time is rough and tough like leather. Figured out I went the wrong route. So I got with a sick tight click and went all out. Catching keys from four C's. Rolling in MVP. Every week we make four C's. Yo, yo, it's a step line. Nah, bam, boom from the gate. Not touch. The court plays short now, face incarceration. Going upstate's my destination. 
destination. The back of a bus, 40 of us. Life as a shorty shouldn't be so rough. But as the world turned, I learned life is hell. Living in the world no different from a cell. Every day I skate from takes, giving chase, selling bass, smoking bones in the staircase. Though I don't know why I chose to smoke cess. I guess that's the time when I'm not depressed. But I'm still depressed. And I ask, what's your work? Ready to get up so I seek the old earth. To explain working hard may help you maintain. To learn to overcome the heartaches and pain. You got stick up, kids, you up, cops and crack rocks. Uncontrolled fire. For the Knicks, they put the shackles on him, man. You know, on this whole game, they locked him up like in a straight jacket or something. When he was in the streets of Philly, playgrounds, oh, he was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know what they call him? What? Jesus. That's what they call him, Jesus, because he was the truth. Then the white media got a hold of it. Then they got to call him Black Jesus. You know, he can't just be Jesus. He got to be Black Jesus, you know, but still, he was the truth. So that's the real reason why you got your name. You name me Jesus after Roman Ruin, not Jesus of the Bible? Not Jesus of the Bible, Jesus of North Philadelphia. Jesus of the playgrounds. That's the truth, son. The way he dished, the way he, you know, he spin, you know how you do. Coming off, all that. Tow. Just steady, aim. And pull on up, nothing to it. No! Let him go down! Do what you're gonna do. Put a big head on me. Go ahead, then. Let him go! Can't do that. Go oh, kill me! They kill me! Now, this is what we've been missing. And it's called the commandments and the law of the spirit. Man. And this is what we've been missing sure has of our culture, stupid. of our heritage. Keeping the most highest laws, statutes, and commandments. Jimmy. Son. If you hit a man in his face, in time, his wounds will heal. And later on, you can apologize to that man. If you steal his goods, later on you can return those goods or you can repay him equal value. But if you kill, there is no later on. There's no way to repair it with that man. There's no way to make it right with him or his family. His life is gone forever. You never come back from that. Ray Ray, 
That boy you're holding is my son. My son. I told a man in prison that I would save my son's life, even if it took my life. I'm willing to die here today, Ray, for my boy, because I love him that much. Do you love him? All I want is to give him something that you or I never had. do it the right way. Okay with you? Any fool with a dick can make a baby, but only a real man can raise his children. Yeah. You the prince, I'm the king. Whip, ring, a supreme ass whip. I mean, beat so bad that we don't know who the hell we are no more. That's an ass whipping. And in great indignation, and cast them into another land. Hold on, what did God do with the Jews? Cast them into another land. What did he do with the so-called Negro? Cast them into another land. What did he do with the West Indians? Cast them into another land. The Haitian? Cast them into another land. Dominican? Cast them into another land. Puerto Rican? Cast them into another land. Argentinian? Cast them into another land. Brazilian? Cast them into another land. Mexican? Another land as what? As it is this day. This day we're right here in America.